This is Joel Bremen, president of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And I welcome you all to our session on COVID-19. Two years ago, uh, on the front of the abstract book of this society, we had a headline, there will be epidemics. Nobody had even heard of COVID-19 at that time, but we were very prescient in regard to addressing the fact that as we speak uh, now, there are microbes percolating in places where we work. This society focuses on the poor countries and our journal immediately jumped in and wrote articles, had commissioned articles from people living in Latin America and Central America, in Africa, and more recently in India, describing the COVID problem because a lot of other journals and media did not address places where we focus. The uh, people in our society have been writing not only articles in journals, but editorials and uh, newsletters and addressing letters to high officials, including the president of our country, FDA, the director of WHO and other people in regard to policies and scientific and public health issues. We uh, in our society take it as our responsibility to not only react and respond, but to detect and prevent these types of epidemics with our 5,000 member groups, over a third of whom live in the poor countries. So with this, I'll turn this over to our scientific program chair, upcoming president-elect of our society, Dan Bausch. Thank you and welcome. Great, Th thanks, Joel. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening. Um, welcome everyone, no matter where you are in the world, tuning in for us today and with us. And, uh, and of course, why wouldn't you tune in with us? We have really an incredible <coughs> panel of expert speakers addressing the foremost issue of our day, COVID-19. As Joel mentioned, the diverse activities of the society, we recognize that the basic sciences, of course, for COVID-19, for example, producing a vaccine is incredibly important. But we also recognize that unless we translate that basic science advancement to policy and implementation, it really doesn't mean anything. And that's why for our symposium today, we have four speakers who really work on that interface between the science and the public health and the, and the policy change to really um, get us to implementation and impact. And so we could go through, a, uh, spend a lot of time for introductions really with this incredible group, but uh, I'll just be very brief. We welcome um, Anthony Fauci, who's the director of the US National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. John Nkengasong, Director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. John gives our commemorative lecture here with this um, symposium. That's a lecture that's presented annually by an invited senior researcher who is resident in the tropics. Um, Dr. Heidi Larson, a colleague and friend of mine at the, the London School, who is also the founding, founding director of the Vaccine Confidence Project. And then Dr. Richard Hatchett, the director of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. We're, we're fortunate to have them with us. And also we're for, fortunate to have Helen Branswell from STAT, who will moderate the discussion following the presentations. Do send in your questions to the Q&A. We'll never have enough time, unfortunately. And, and I will mention that Dr. Fauci, unfortunately, has another commitment, so won't be able to join us for the questions. But with that, I will um, give it over to our first speaker. Thanks very much to all our panelists, and let's plunge in. Greetings. My name is Tony Fauci, and it is my great pleasure to speak to the annual meeting of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene about COVID-19. I also thank you for all your good work, especially in these difficult times. As you can see from this first slide, 
I'm going to be discussing the public health as well as the scientific challenges associated with the historic COVID-19 pandemic. This slide shows the cover of JAMA from a viewpoint that my colleagues and I published in January of this year. And as you could see from the title, it says coronavirus infections more than just the common cold. I did not choose that to in any way be facetious, but I wanted to point out to the readers of the viewpoint, the fact that we have had experience with coronaviruses now for decades and decades. In fact, if you look at this phylogenetic tree of the coronaviruses, the human coronaviruses are indicated in red letters. There are bat and other intermediate hosts in which coronaviruses are important in that these animals are a very critical reservoir for these viruses. But pointing out on the slide, the four coronaviruses that are highlighted in yellow are the common cold coronaviruses that together account for about 15 to 30% of all of the common colds that we repetitively experience, usually throughout the winter months. And then in 2002, uh, we had the first experience with a pandemic coronavirus with SARS. And then in 2012, we had the experience with MERS, another coronavirus. If you take a look at these two, the SARS coronavirus emerged from China in the Guangdong province from a bat to a civet cat to a human, leading to a global outbreak of 8,000 cases and almost 800 deaths. Although it transmitted readily from human to human, it did not have a high degree of, of efficiency. And so public health measures, including quarantine and contact tracing, essentially extinguished the outbreak without any other intervention. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, began in 2012, again from a bat to a camel to a human. It had an outbreak that was mostly confined to the Middle East, but did have some global spread. And in fact, it is still uh, occasionally re-emerging, usually in Saudi Arabia and other Middle East countries. Fast forward to today, we have now the third pandemic coronavirus, which appeared clinically in China in the Wuhan district in December of 2019 and was identified as a novel coronavirus by the Chinese in the first week of January of 2020. And getting back to the phylogenetic tree, you can see where it stands relative to the other viruses. Note that since it's phylogenetically proximal, to the original SARS, the original SARS was given the name SARS-CoV-1 and the new virus SARS-CoV-2. And so for terminology's sake, the disease is COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019 because of the December 2019 recognition. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the virus itself is referred to as SARS-CoV-2. So here we are now with a global pandemic of historic proportions, the likes of which we have not seen in the last 102 years since the now iconic outbreak of the pandemic of 1918. Currently, there are close to 50 million cases with 1.2 million deaths worldwide. In the United States, we have been hit the hardest of any other country with close to 10 million cases and over 230 million deaths. The heat map here showing the relative density of cases per 100,000 population. I wanna take a moment to compare the response and the dynamics in the United States versus Europe. As shown here, the blue line where the European Union got hit earlier and peaked a little bit earlier than we did but after the initial assault came back down to a very low baseline, where we in the United States, where our first big outbreak was dominated by the Northeastern corridor, particularly the metropolitan area of New York City, which went up to a high level, but never ever came down to a low baseline, even as New York sharply came down. Because at that point, other areas of our large country 
we're beginning to have cases. Note that around June 19th, we had the beginning of a resurgence of cases due to the attempts to so-called reopen the economy or reopen the country, which was done variably with regard to adhering to the guidelines which came out. Different states did it differently, and we had a resurgence back up to close to 70,000, went back down, stayed around 40,000 for a while, and now is going up to 86,000 with a mean, I say an average of weekly, somewhere around 80,000. Unfortunately, on October the 5th, uh, October the 4th, excuse me, on November the 4th, we hit 100,000 cases in a single day. The European Union, as you see in the blue line, is doing really rather poorly also with a resurgence of cases mostly related to the cooler weather of the fall and coming winter, driving people indoors with activities that would otherwise be done outdoors. Now, why the difference? If you go back to this slide, why did we in the United States not go back down to a low baseline after our initial peak? If you look at the degree to which we actually shut down or locked down, there was significant difference between the European Union and the United States. When you do GPSs to look at mobility over time in parks and outdoor spaces, note the United States does not go down nearly as much as Italy and Spain, which are representative of the European Union. When you look at going to workplaces, the same thing. The United States in the dark line does not go down nearly as much as Spain and Italy. And even more emphatically, when you look at visits to grocery and pharmacy stores, again, the United States does not go down nearly as much as those other countries. That's the epidemiology. Let's take a quick look at the virology. As I mentioned, this is a beta coronavirus. It's an RNA virus, has a large genome, multiple structural proteins, the most important of which is the S protein, which stands for the spike protein giving its appearance of a corona or a crown, a crown when you look at it under electron microscopy. The receptor binding domain of the spike binds to the ACE2 cellular receptor, which is distributed widely in the upper and lower airways, as well as the GI tract, as well as other body, uh, 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 excuse me, other systems of the body, such as the neurological system and the cardiovascular system. Transmission. Clearly, this is a respiratory-borne virus, and transmission is through exposure to respiratory droplets. The standard larger droplets that we know of that tend to fall within a few feet of being expelled from the infected person but we're also realizing now that there is some degree, we don't know exactly what percentage, but some degree of aerosol spread. Aerosol meaning smaller droplets that have the capability of remaining suspended in the air for longer periods of time and over various distances. The virus is found in other bodily fluids, stool, blood, semen, et cetera. Its role in transmission is not known, but likely not of considerable importance. The fundamentals to preventing the acquisition and the transmission of SARS coronavirus 2 are fivefold. One is the universal wearing of masks or cloth coverings. The other is maintaining physical distances at least six feet to avoid crowds and congregate settings, particularly indoor situations. Conduct activities outdoors much more preferentially than indoors and frequently washing hands. If those five uh, public health measures were adhered to universally and consistently over the country. It is clear from our previous experience with other nations and even regions in our own country, we would not be having the degree of surging of cases that we are currently seeing. The clinical manifestations are protean. If you look at the initial signs and symptoms, they resemble very much what we see in a typical flu-like syndrome as shown by the indications on this slide. There is, however, a peculiar loss of smell and taste which precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms in certain individuals. Individuals, about 80% uh, have mild to moderate symptoms, whereas about 15 to 20% 
have severe symptoms. It should also be pointed out that a considerable proportion, up to 40%, have no symptoms at all. The case fatality rate varies from a few percent under certain circumstances to about 20 to 25% in people who in fact require mechanical ventilation. People who are at increased risk for severe COVID disease include older individuals and people of any age with certain underlying conditions. If you look at the data related to age, it's striking. The parameter used here is the rate of hospitalizations per 100,000 populations. And take a look at the extraordinary disparity between hospitalizations and younger individuals on the left-hand part of the slide compared to the elderly between 75 and 85 plus on the right-hand part of the slide. In addition to the elderly, people literally of any age with certain underlying medical conditions. Under these conditions, there's an increased risk that's clearly associated with COVID illness, severe COVID illness. In other words, those individuals who would fall in the category that I showed you on the prior slide of having severe or critical illness. Paramount among this is obesity and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as well as other conditions such as chronic heart conditions and hypertension. Those conditions that may confer an increased risk for severe disease are shown here. Again, I point out a few that dominate. One is hypertension and the other is overweight, not quite getting to the definition of obesity, but overweight being an important one. If you look at the manifestations of severe COVID-19, they are plentiful. I mentioned the cardiac ones, but there are also acute respiratory distress syndrome. There is kidney injury, neurological injury, a hypercoagulable state manifested by microthrombi in small vessels, an acute thrombotic phenomenon sometimes seen in otherwise well young individuals. There's also a curious multisystem inflammatory syndrome first described in children resembling Kawasaki syndrome. In addition, there is what we call a post-COVID-19 syndrome, which in variable percentages, and we're working out right now what percentage that is, of people who have symptomatic disease, be it symptoms that don't necessarily require hospitalization or symptoms that actually drive people to requiring hospitalizations. When they recover virologically, a certain percentage, sometimes as high as one third, experience lingering symptoms for weeks to months, including profound fatigue, shortness of breath, muscle aches, occasional fever, dysautonomia, and what some describe as brain fog or an inability to concentrate. Moving on to racial and ethnic disparities, this is really quite serious. In the United States, we are seeing a rather profound disparity, not only in the incidence of infections due to the jobs that people of a minority demographic group, namely African-American and Latinx have, that put them out in the community exposed to infection, but also an increased incidence of the comorbidities, which in fact allow for more severe COVID-19 disease. This is a striking slide. If you look at, again, the parameter of the rate of hospitalization per 100,000 population, look at the three top bars with Latinx, American Indian, Alaska Natives, and African Americans going from 390 to 408 compared to white non-Hispanics at 94. Moving on to therapeutics, the NIH has established an expert treatment guidelines panel, which puts forth a living document online that is frequently updated in real time, providing for the medical community the latest clinical data, both published as well as expert opinion, to help and assist the clinicians dealing with this disease to use the most updated data in the care of their patients. This is easily accessible. 
on COVID-19 treatment guidelines.nih.gov. That's COVID-19 treatment guidelines.nih.gov. If you don't remember that, just put NIH.gov and you could find it in the search instrument. Now, with regard to the therapeutics, there have been two that have been now recommended by the guidelines panel. Remdesivir for hospitalized individuals who have lung involvement and dexamethasone for hospitalized individuals who are, have ventilatory requirements and or high flow oxygen requirements. In that study, which is a randomized control trial, placebo control, it was a clear cut benefit in diminishing the 28 day mortality in the dexamethasone group. In addition, there are examples of other investigational therapies, direct antivirals, blood derived products such as convalescent plasma, hyperimmune globulin, monoclonal antibody studies are being very actively pursued now, as well as immunomodulators. And finally, let's move on to vaccine. We at the NIH and in the federal government have adopted a strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine research and development as articulated in this piece in science from May of this year. By a strategic approach, we mean harmonized protocols in which the six companies that are involved in Operation Warp Speed that is being helped by, developed by, and supported by the federal government, when these six companies now adopt a common data and safety monitoring board, common primary and secondary endpoints, and common immunological parameters that would allow us to bridge one study to another. This is a list of the three separate platforms and the companies involved. As you can see, we have a nucleic acid platform predominantly messenger RNA from both Pfizer and Moderna, viral vectors from AstraZeneca, Janssen, and Merck, including adenovirus vectors and VSV, and protein subunits together with an adjuvant from Novavax and Sanofi. We have six of these going, three of which are in phase three trial, two of which Moderna and Pfizer began in July 27th. Both of those are fully enrolled. And as we have seen from the very exciting news just recently, Pfizer, when their data and safety monitoring board looked at the data in their 44,000 people in that clinical trial using a messenger RNA showed a more than 90% efficacy. This is a very important advance. Moderna company is very close behind soon to be able to look at their data to determine if they have the same sort of results. And the other companies are also not far behind. We now look at this with cautious optimism that by the end of this calendar year and well into 2021, we will be administering doses first to the highest priority and then ultimately to virtually everybody in the United States as we get into several months into 2021. I'd like to close by putting this slide up. It is the prevention network, the COVID-19. As you can see, you can access this online at www.preventcovid.org. That's www.preventcovid.org. And for those who have any interest in enrolling in the still ongoing clinical prevention trials, please take a look at this, no obligation. You can just indicate your interest in participating. Thank you. Thank let, let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to uh, be part of this contribution. I would like to spend the next couple of minutes uh, discussing Africa's response to COVID-19. And to do that, I would like to address four things. One is look at the continental preparedness and response, and then review for you the epidemiological update as, as we speak as of today, and also uh, look at examine some genomic sequences we are seeing on the virus on the continent and conclude with the way forward. So starting with the continental preparedness, it's always good to start telling a story from Egypt, 
where on 14 of February, the first cases of COVID-19 were reported. And after we watched the, how this, the pandemic was playing out in China, Europe, and the United States, and we finally reported the cases on the 14 of February. And since then, we developed um, this a slide shows you a timeline of what um, the, the, how the continent started getting organized. Exactly one week after uh, the 14th of February, we convened a meeting in Addis Ababa on the 22nd of February, where we brought together all ministers of health to agree on the need to establish a joint continental strategy and a task force. And then subsequently, as you can see here, other important timelines that uh, we organized the continent with a strong leadership from uh, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa in his capacity as the chair of the African Union and um, chairperson Musa Faki of the African Union Commission. This slide just shows you the picture of the meeting I described, alluded to earlier on this February 22nd, where Chairperson Musa Faki and all ministers of her uh, gathered to discuss a, a, the need to have a joint continental strategy, which you see, you see on the slide on your right hand side. The strategy actually captures three goals. First of all, we said we consider that it was important to have a prevent to a strategy that will prevent the transmission or limit the transmission. Secondly, to limit deaths, and lastly, to limit harm and uh, both social harm and economic harm. The social harm here meaning uh, the effect of COVID on other uh, endemic diseases, i.e., HIV, TB, malaria, and immunization programs. And subsequently, we developed. The first joint activity was called a Partnership to Accelerate COVID Testing, abbreviated PACT, which was underpinned by the need to test, to trace, and to treat. And we set ourselves some ambitious targets at that time, for example, uh, to uh, de uh, deploy more than 10 million tests, uh, also activate more than 1 million community healthcare workers, uh, establish a joint platform for the continent that will allow all 55 countries to procure uh, COVID-related commodities there. And we have since exceeded most of these targets, including certain new targets of 20 million tests to be conducted by uh, November. This slide shows you an example of what the platform I just described earlier, which is a, a single continental platform where member states could go into and access uh, then uh, uh, commodities, what we call commonly called COVID-related uh, commodities. And this is an example of a, a public-private partnership between uh, Stripe Masiwa, who is a special envoy for the, uh, the AU, nominated by President Cyril Maposa, the Afri Exim Bank, and the UN Economic Commission for Africa. If you just Google uh, AMSP.Africa, you can actually have take the pleasure and fun of uh, browsing through to see exactly how the platform looks like. And I will just go through a series of slides in the, uh, to uh, uh, describe for you what some of the response activities have been like, and also what the preparation leading up to the first cases look like. This slide shows you the number of countries that we have actually deployed Africa CDC responders, 23 of them, and at least uh, 200 epidemiologists. And we've also deployed over 9,000 community healthcare workers that will support the contact tracing that I described earlier in 18 countries. The slide you've seen here is remarkable because it tells a very important story. In January, if we were hit as a continent by COVID, there was absolutely no country that had the reagents uh, to test for COVID. So we actually scrambled and started with Senegal, where we uh, started putting in capacity there, and South Africa developed their own capacity. We subsequently used these two countries to rally the continent around and train rapidly to get the continent prepared. And we have since uh, trained over 1,000 300 lab experts roll out about 6 million tests from the Africa CDC, which is part of the 20 million tests we've conducted so far. And as of today, I'm pleased to announce that all countries on the continent have that capability to test for COVID-19, which was not the case in January. 
And this slide just simply shows you some of the trainings that were conducted both in Senegal and in South Africa within a, a short period of two weeks to bring the continent up to speed. We also knew that as we were, there, we were preparing to record the first cases of COVID-19, that infection prevention control uh, were a very important aspects that needed technical assistance from the Africa CDC. And over 22 countries were trained on what uh, prevention control measures were required. And we have now since moved into the area of preparing the continent for vaccines. And we just recently published um, a, a commentary in Nature where we argued that uh, history must not repeat itself and that we needed a global and a continental cooperative approach to ensure that uh, the, the continent of Africa have access to COVID-19. So why is history not repeating itself? What do we mean by that? This slide shows, uh, uh, I mean, I've, sh I've shown this slide over and over. It shows uh, back in the mid 1990s when ARVs were available, that are drugs against HIV. And it will take up to 10 years before uh, they, they actually Africa had access to it. And in between that period, about 12 million Africans died because of HIV infections where uh, treatment was available. We are very conscious of that and really want to ensure that history doesn't repeat itself this time around. Because of that, President Ramaphosa actually um, con uh, convened a series of meetings with other head of states. And we have since presented the Africa CDC uh, uh, strategy for vaccines to the leadership of the continent. And it can read on the last sentence in bold or uh, on the line in red, which says the head of states and governments stress that Africa should take appropriate measures as part of the strategy that we presented to them to ensure that it is uh, secures timely access to COVID-19 vaccines when they become available. So the strategy that, uh, uh, has, has three pillars. First of all, it calls for a full participation in clinical trials. And second, that Africa have access to sufficient vaccine supply when they are available. And lastly, to remove barriers to vaccine delivery and uptake. And the slide that you see here shows some of these vaccine sites that are already uh, sites that are already conducting clinical trials, and also uh, in blue uh, uh, sites that are capable of quickly ramping up clinical trials on the continent. And we published this in, in Nature a few weeks ago, and it's part of a consortium for clinical trials that we set up uh, to facilitate and enable trials on the continent. We envisage that for Africa to achieve herd immunity, which is uh, uh, one of our goals, 60% of the population will need to be vaccinated. And this was going to cost about 10 to $15 billion for a continent of 1.2 uh, uh, billion uh, population. And just two weeks ago, the, the President Ramaphosa established a task force that will help support us in this effort to achieve the intended target, and it's called the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Force, AVATT. This slide shows uh, clearly how uh, the continent uh, reacted to COVID-19 very early on. On the top panel shows changes on international travel restrictions, and you can see that uh, it's also plotting the number of uh, cases very early on, like it took, we, we, between the first case and to, uh, uh, the one, first 100 cases, it took us 24 days. Uh, between the first 100 cases and 1,000 cases, 10, 10 days, and 18 days between 1,000 cases and 10,000 cases. The rest of the, 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 the slide shows you also schools closures and stay at home measures and massive lockdowns that uh, the continent undertook. And this slide very quickly shows you where, where the continent is heading with respect to having a trusted travel uh, a mechanism that uh, try, seeks to coordinate uh, behavior across uh, the 55 member states with respect to pre-entering and exit uh, conditions across the continent. Let me now switch to the epidemiological situation on the continent. The slide here shows you <clears throat> where we are today. As a continent, we have recorded 1.9 million cases with 1.6 million recoveries, representing about 84%. And unfortunately, 47,000 deaths have occurred, representing 2.4% uh, case fatality rate. 
And the slide that you see here just maps out how uh, the, the pandemic has evolved in Africa. Like it took us 133 days to get to, from zero cases to half a million cases. Then it accelerated by third, uh, within 30 days, we got up to a million and then slowed down some from 1 million to 1.5. And again, we can see again, as you see in the subsequent slide that the pandemic is beginning to gain uh, uh, momentum. And this slide very quickly shows you uh, the, what I just described previously. And the red line there is a seven days moving average for the entire continent. And the different colors there indicate uh, the, uh, the, 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 the ge geographic distribution of the pandemic by region, Central Africa, East, Northern, Southern, and West Africa. And as you can see clearly on this slide, at the peak of this pandemic, we had uh, we were recording 18,000 cases a day, and the, we, the continent bent the curve nicely, right up to a period of September, October, where we were recording just about 7,000 cases a day. But you can see that there's a tail, a very worrying tail is beginning to emerge, and we are recording now about 10,000 cases per day. And you very clearly showing that if not, something is not done, we will be getting a second peak very, very uh, uh, sooner than later. This slide uh, shows the uh, number of the, the few countries that are reporting now over 70% of new cases in Africa. And that include Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco in North Africa, Kenya in East Africa, and South Africa in, in the southern part of, of the continent. So I think these are countries that we are watching very, very carefully. The slide you see here shows you the new COVID-19 case, uh, COVID cases reported by the AU member states per 1 million population per day. And it clearly shows that 46 countries are reporting less than uh, 40 cases uh, per million per day. And uh, I mean, a country like um, Algeria is uh, showing, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, 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 Libya is showing uh, uh, 80 to 100 cases per million uh, per day. I would now like to just show you the five regions in more details. The overall increase in Africa we are now recording is about 18% 18, 18 increase. We are recording in Central and West Africa continue to see some reductions, but increases, steady increases in North Africa Southern Africa and East Africa, so which again reflects in on the overall tra 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 trajectory that the continent is heading to. Now, uh, South Africa for example, uh, has bent its curve very, very nicely, but we are seeing a pattern between September, October, and November that is concerning. Clearly, very slow increase between September and October with plus 2%, but now a rapid increase of about 17%. Then we look at Morocco very carefully. Right up to August, Morocco seemed to have maintained the pandemic under control, but you can see clearly that uh, between September and November, the cases have increased from about 41% to over 74%. And then Tunisia, very similarly, right up to August, and that coincides with the summer start of summer in Tunisia, you clearly see that the pandemic was really under control. But since then, we are now seeing a very remarkable increases of about more than close to 300% between September and October. And now it's, we hope that the plus five represents a flattening of, of the curve. Ethiopia is, uh, continues to show uh, 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 nice decreases in the number of cases. And their, their peak, as you can see, uh, occurred around August. But ho hopefully, that trend will be maintained. And um, Kenya, next slide, please. I think based on this graph is clearly uh, showing that Kenya is uh, witnessing the second peak already. The first peak occurred around August, and now we are seeing a second peak uh, occurring around this mid-November timeframe. 
Now let's move on to the testing. As we speak as a continent, as I indicated earlier, about 20 million tests have been conducted with a case uh, per, uh, a test per case ratio of 10 and a positivity rate of 9.8%. And the graph on the left-hand side just shows uh, the number of tests conducted and the number of uh, 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 the cases uh, recorded and the positivity rate. On this slide, you showed a distribution of tests per country, how each uh, several countries, again, uh, really have improved the testing. 27 countries are recording more than 10 to 30 tests per case, 10 countries between 31 to 100 cases, and two countries more than 100 cases, which was not the case uh, earlier on when we started. I think this shows very good progress. And just a few weeks ago, in partnership with the World Health Organization, uh, United, uh, the FINE, the Global Fund, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, we announced an initiative to increase the, the testing by 120 million antigen tests. And we really hope that this will go a long way uh, to increase the ability to test more people on the continent and control the disease. And let me now uh, move, uh, switch to over to the genomic sequencing update and discuss the, 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 how sequencing, the amount of sequencing we are seeing here. So Africa CDC has been working with 15 countries to strengthen the ability uh, to sequence the, uh, the virus to better understand and characterize the, the, uh, the circulation of the viruses on the continent. If you look at this slide carefully, you realize that most genomes are coming from Southern Africa because they have more capacity. But it's also encouraging to see that a total of about 3,600 sequences have been generated across Africa as of uh, uh, yesterday or today. And uh, again, very encouraging to see that sequencing is not only occurring in South Africa, but it's occurring fairly across the entire continent, including DRC, Senegal, Uganda, Kenya, and other places there. We really hope that this will continue to increase and uh, improve our ability to understand how the virus is circulating on the continent. And as you can see on this slide, there are several clades, uh, eight clades that have been identified based on phylogenetic tree analysis. If you look at the first bar on the left hand side there, it shows clearly that most. Uh, sequences that you see or strains that you see on the continent are the, 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 the G, uh, the uh, arrow strains, which are very similar to the European strains, which clearly shows that most of the viruses that we had were importations from, from Europe. And uh, but, however, the pattern is also changing on the continent, as we see on this slide. If you look at a series of countries in West Africa, Mali, uh, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, right up to Nigeria, Nigeria, it shows a very different clade pattern occurring in on that part of the continent. And this is mainly the S and the V strains uh, around that Western African region. So it continues to, uh, again, uh, it suggests that we should uh, keep an eye on the, the circulation of the viruses across the continent. And if you even look at some individual countries like Tanzania, uh, 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 Gambia, no, no, sorry, Gambia and Senegal and DRC and Rwanda, you see that the pattern there is very different of the different genomes that we are seeing on the continent. And the question that we've asked ourselves is that uh, with a focus on the spike protein, is there any difference between the strains we are seeing in Africa and other parts of, of the world? Next slide. And this slide clearly shows you uh, the, 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 the focus on this, the mutation, the 614 mutation. And the good news is that that, that, that area is fairly stable, even across the, the strains that we are seeing on the continent of Africa, when you compare that to Asia, Europe, Middle East, North Africa, and, and, and uh, the ocean. Again, that suggests to us that at least the vaccines that are being produced uh, will have a good chance of also being effective on the continent of Africa. That is very good news. Next slide. It shows you how this uh, mutation has changed over time. And the, the red color there shows the G614 mutation and the blue color, the D614 mutation. And as you can clearly see early on in February, it was a mixture, but now it looks like predominantly the, the G614 uh, uh, genomes are actually taking a hold on, on the continent. I think this suggests that we need to continue to 
uh, uh, monitored uh, the pandemic on the continent and because it has tremendous implications for diagnostic efficacy and also on the understanding of the, the, the distribution in terms of pockets of outbreaks that will need to be confronted as we ease the lockdown on the economy and people begin to move more frequently across the continent. Let me now just uh, move to the conclusion and, and share some final takeaway messages there. First of all is that the key unifying leadership of the, the continent very early on in February has been a very critical uh, factor in, uh, uh, in moderating the spread of the virus on the continent. As a matter of fact, if the continent didn't go into a massive shutdown early on in March, uh, with the rates in South Africa, for example, were doubling every, every, every two days. So I think that would have been a severe pandemic in, East Af in South Africa. Second is that the COVID-19 uh, uh, really uh, needs to be a catalyst for the continent to really argue for a new public health order where we truly focus on developing diagnostics on the continent, developing clinic, more clinical trials on the continent and developing the development of therapeutics on the continent. The third uh, uh, takeaway message is that partnerships matter, and that has to be a very uh, a clear fundamental principle guiding our ability to fight this virus using a cooperative approach, a collaborative approach, a coordinated approach, and a communicative approach. The fourth message that we, uh, we uh, is that public health workforce is very important. One of the greatest challenges we've had on the continent is the ability to have competent workforce that can easily be deployed across, across the continent to support member states. We've actually had to work with the Peace and Security Council to go to the DRC, hire a military plane, a C-130 plane to uh, transport responders from DRC to Cameroon, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso to support the, the response. I think that means as we move forward, we really have to deliberately focus on the training, the field epidemiology training experts as well as the frontline workers. But lastly, to invest in local manufacturing, local manufacturing of especially of vaccines. Let me then conclude by uh, this key message is that the continent cannot and must not get uh, into a mode of a complacency because we clearly see that uh, there's, uh, the, 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 there's a creeping up of the new cases on the continent, which is not a good sign. We are seeing what is happening in Europe and is clearly uh, going to happen in Africa if we begin to relax the prevention measures then. So first of all, we have to enhance our engagement with the community and really continue to call for their cooperation so that they, they use face masks consistently. We cannot at all get into the mode of uh, prevention fatigue on the continent. Continent. Second is that we have to continue to avoid large gathering and crowded events. I know political events are occurring on the continent of Africa, elections are taking place, but we really have to know, make uh, sure that the gains that we've achieved over the last couple of months, 10 months, are not eroded because of these large gatherings for political rallies or campaigns. Thirdly, is that we need to continue to increase our testing capacity across the continent and enhance that with the ability to trace and treat and really focus on enhanced surveillance so that we can pick up the hotspots very quickly and, and act on them. And lastly, to ensure that there's a sufficient supply for personal protective equipment uh, to continue to enhance our ability to, uh, uh, to uh, ensure that those prevention and public health messages are enforced within the community. And lastly, I would just like to, again, end up with this slide by showing you the, the, the plane that we actually uh, described earlier, which was a truly a remarkable cooperation amongst several African member states, because if you recall at that time, the airspace was locked. We had to really work with governments of several countries to be able to allow us to use a military plane to uh, go across several countries in Africa to pick those epidemiologists and deploy them across the entire continent. That is truly a remarkable sign of how coordination and cooperation should be uh, established to fight a pandemic disease like the COVID-19. Thank you so much for your uh, attention.
Um, hi. Sorry, is um, I thought Richard was next. My understanding is Richard was next on the agenda. Thanks. Um, well, that uh, <laughs> following uh, such a, a uh, an impressive and and very um, heartening and positive, particularly <laughs> sitting in Europe now, uh, what Africa has been under John's leadership has been uh, tremendous. Um, I'm uh, going to take a bit of a different uh, tack, which is in the context of a, a lot of positive news about vaccines, just um, take a look at some of the challenges uh, we have, uh, not to undermine the positive bit, but just to help our, our level of preparedness. Um, my topic uh, in the context of lessons learned and future challenges is on vaccine acceptance, and I just uh, added the question mark. Um, oops. Um, I was a bit shy to consider lessons learned when we don't even have a vaccine being rolled out yet outside of trials. So uh, from my perspective, I think when it comes to lessons learned around the vaccines, we're just in kindergarten here. The lessons are about to begin. Um, I think anything we've had in previous uh, vaccine introduction, um, we have bits and pieces of lessons we could bring to COVID, but this is this is the first of this kind that we've certainly had in the last century. There's newness at every level, the, the virus itself, the platforms they're made on, uh, the environment we're in of hyper uncertainty. Um, it's, it's a very different environment than anything, certainly in the vaccine space that we've seen um, ever, I think. Um, I lead, I founded a, a decade ago, uh, concerned about what I saw as a growing trend in some questioning and hesitation and some outright refusal of vaccines in some settings. Um, I, I thought we really needed to understand what was driving some of the questioning and how we can get ahead of it. Um, we recognize early in the confidence project the importance of not just confidence in the vaccine, but confidence in the providers, confidence in policymakers, and confidence in systems. Um, this is is even more acute in the context of COVID, where trust in government, trust in the overall COVID response and how it's been managed will absolutely influence uh, the public's willingness to accept a vaccine if they haven't had a positive experience so far. So not to say it's not gonna be possible, but in places where the trust relations have uh, been worn in the response, we're gonna need to work harder. Um, um, uh, just uh, a month ago, um, my research group published a five-year analysis of our vaccine confidence index results. Uh, we launched a vaccine confidence index in 2015, just mapping, giving a global uh, comparable index that we could see where's the confidence. Um, you know, people ask me a lot, oh, is it just, is it really getting worse or is it the same or is it what's, and we had no benchmark. So we established a benchmark in 2015. We've been doing waves around the world. Um, and we've, uh, with looking at efficacy, safety, compatibility with beliefs, and we looked at a number of trends. So this is looking between 2015 and 2018. Why does this matter? This is the background of vaccine confidence that we will be introducing the COVID vaccine into. This matters because it shows where we might have to work a bit harder and where we already have more positive and vaccined, vaccine um, 
positive and less positive and where we'll have to make more effort. Overall, the good news is um, because there was a recognition back in 2015 that we were um, starting to lose some confidence in vaccines in different parts of the world. There were efforts made and there has been some improvement in, co in confidence globally in the importance and to a certain extent effectiveness of vaccines. But when it comes to safety, um, that has not improved as much uh, in fact, it's gotten worse in some places and, and slightly better in others. Um, I was interested in what uh, John Kengason just talked about in terms of some of the North African countries. Uh, here, some of the places in Africa where confidence has gotten worse uh, is in the North Africa region and in part um, the middle in uh, South America, which historically has been quite a vaccine uh, champion, uh, is wearing thin when it comes to confidence in vaccines. Uh, Europe has quite a lot of skepticism around vaccine. It's gotten a little better, but less so around safety. This is just to lay the landscape of what overall vaccine confidence is. We ask about vaccines generally. We also apply this to specific vaccines such as MMR, HPV, flu. What was interesting since COVID in our 2020 uh, results across Europe is that we saw a 17% increase in the confidence in the flu vaccine. And that was provoked by uh, COVID. The question is always then, do we have enough supply? Um, in our overall global study, um, what did we find? Um, oops, sorry. Uh, Indonesia had the most dramatic drop in public confidence between 2015 and 2019, um, both across importance and effectiveness. Um, and because a group of Islamic leaders uh, issued a fatwa, a statement that they felt like the measles vaccine was religiously forbidden, which created a lot of uncertainty uh, and, and had a nationally uh, a repercussions on it. Why does that matter and why do we need to pay attention to it? Well, Indonesia is looking like it's one of the first countries that's been, um, there are a few of them, but um, they're announced, they were early already in September, um, making uh, arrangements with Sinovac um, uh, for a COVID vaccine. Um, they had were in discussions and made agreements with the British COVID vaccine, so they were ready. And um, both around trials, but then in terms of being ready for emergency use. And there was recent announcement, they're hoping to roll it out by the start emergency use by the end of the year. This is on the background of one of the biggest drops in vaccine confidence globally. We need to pay attention to that. We need to, where we do see encouragement and moving ahead on the introduction of a vaccine, if we know already that the background confidence in vaccine has not been great, this is going to need extra effort. This would be different in another country, but this is where having that um, landscaping can be helpful for countries as they prepare their rollout. It's been a, a confusing landscape for some. Uh, it's been positive, but it's been confusing, particularly as public are reading the media, reading the press. On the one hand, you get in, in nature researchers uh, highlighting questionable data in the Russian coronavirus vaccine trial. This was back in September. And uh, soon after, uh, literally like the same week, um, there was news that India was procuring, uh, uh, making arrangements for 100 million of the doses from Russia. So for someone trying to understand what, uh, you know, what to have confidence in and one thing says it's risky and another says we want 100 million doses, it's, uh, it, it is making the communications and engagement and acceptability environment more complicated. Um, again, on the one hand, we've had this very hopeful uh, news this week, although it's not the final 
um, trial results. Uh, we heard um, Pfizer with 90% effect efficacy. And again, other news saying it'll boost the global economy, but not all at once. I think one of the most enthusiastic reactions to the news was Wall Street, the stock markets, <laughs> um, with the enthusiasm as if every, you know, economies would bounce back. Not so quickly as the Wall Street Journal also said. We also had news um, about uh, the Russian vaccine Sputnik with, with announcing 90% um, uh, oops, 92% uh, efficacy following the, the Pfizer news. And in the same week, we've had news that Brazil halted the trial of, of the Chinese um, uh, COVID vaccine. Um, but there, due to a, a coincidental death that some thought the trial should not have been stopped because it was not due to the to the vaccine, but at this coincidental. But that was another piece of news that was out there. So putting yourself in, in the seat of the public, trying to make sense of what these different vaccines and what the news is telling us, it's been a complicated landscape. Again, an overall tone of hopefulness, but a bit of um, back and forth. This is important because it's going to have to shape how we manage uh, and explain um, these uh, differences to the public and, frankly, to healthcare providers who will be the first to be expected to get vaccinated. And they, too, are watching this space very closely. Um, at the same time, you know, with our positivism and, and euphoria about the hopes of a vaccine, which are all important, um, there's also a caution about, um, you know, we can't, there's not one holy grail that we can hang our hook on. And, and the, even a highly effective vaccine by itself is not going to get everything back to normal um, with the speed that I think many people would would like, um, everybody would like, but um, it, the, the voice of um, reality check, as it were, uh, comes in too. Um, oops. Um, I'm just putting a bit of context here. Uh, the kind of questioning and hesitation and the issues uh, is not new. Uh, we've had it from the early, these are these uh, cartoons here are from the 1800s. Even the term misinformation is not, is not new to social media. It goes way back from the early days of vaccines. Um, you know, notions of not, again, it's against God's plan. It's not natural, as we're hearing with some of the rumors about RNA, DNA, uh, anxieties, um, misinformation. Um, these are these are old uh, standing anxieties about will it be um, imposed? Will there be vaccine mandates around uh, the corona, the COVID vaccine? Which um, so a lot of these uh, anxieties are are not new, um, but they're playing out differently at a speed and scope um, because of the hyper connected. Uh, environment, which in 2013, I follow the World Economic Forum risks uh, reports very closely. In 2013, I thought they had a very apt characterization of the landscape we have, digital wildfires in a hyper-connected world, backlash against globalization um, and global control, uh, and the dangers of hubris on human health. This is really important in the context of you know, the scientific um, hopes and, and focus on the, the vaccine um, as being the, the cure-all, which it will be an absolute uh, ga game changer to have that vaccine. But we do need to remember the many other things around it that we are still going to have a lot of work to do. Um, this was in 2018, among many articles that we're writing about the next pandemic. We are going to get one. We need to get ready. I had written about uh, the biggest risk is viral misinformation. It has been a huge challenge, um, more frankly than I 
already anticipated in 2018. And I've had a lot of questions um, from uh, from various uh, national health authorities and organizations saying, well, is this misinformation problem really a problem? Is it really going to affect people's choices or is it just an annoyance? Um, we did a control trial to answer this question. Uh, we just got our uh, results um, recently. And what we found, and this was preliminary in uh, a sample of 4,000 people in the US and 4,000 in the UK, um, is similar trials we're going to be doing in different settings. Uh, we found that in before we did um, interviews and discussions with people about their COVID experience more broadly, within which we asked a question about willingness to to take a vaccine, then showed them five of the most frequently circulating pieces of misinformation, and then came back to them. And that's with 3,000, with 1,000 uh, people, they were shown straightforward scientific information. Uh, and we did the same thing in the US. Uh, 3,000 saw the misinformation, 1,000 didn't. Well, there was in the UK a 6.4 percent point drop in the willingness, intended willingness to take a vaccine after being exposed to some of these more frequently circulating misinformation. Granted, this was a control trial, um, not in, I mean, this was in a, an experimental setting, not uh, in out in a random, I mean, in the public in general, but still it was controlled uh, in different settings with a, a very large representative sample and should be an indicator. We will be running this in different countries and different cultural settings. Um, so these things matter. We need to manage them. We need to build resilience in the public to be critical of some of the things uh, they're seeing. We also need to recognize that um, it's not just about one platform. There's a lot of fingers pointing to Facebook. Well, that's fine if people, you know, in the Philippines, for instance, doing some interventions with Facebook could make a big difference. That's their absolute biggest platform. But in other countries, it's different ones. In Japan, it's Twitter. In Kenya, it's um, it's messaging and what's up. Brazil, it's absolutely what's up. In most of Africa, frankly, it's it's more these private circles. So if you shut down Facebook, it's not going to have that much impact there. So we need to understand the landscape. Um, what are we learning in our surveys about willingness to take a vaccine, a COVID vaccine, if and when, uh, which you know when it will become you know approved as safe and effective? This was in 17 countries. The darkest blue is the is the strongly agree. I will take it. Uh, light blue is I agree. I'll probably will. Um, strongly disagree is the orange. There's an ambiguity there too. Is some. It's highly varied across the world. Um, DRC, Pakistan and Nigeria had the highest numbers. Are strongly disagree, which is unlikely to change. Uh, the ones that are uncertain is. I think perfectly reasonable and would might be open to change, but why this um, uh, this in, this study we've been doing with misinformation matters is because even um, without even looking at the willingness to take a vaccine now, if you add strongly agree and probably agree, um, we're still not really getting to what is likely to be herd immunity. So we can't afford as countries, uh, as populations to even get a 6.4% drop or a 3% drop. It's very much a tipping point phenomenon. So we need to build resilience and engagement now or already, we need to be in communities listening, what are the concerns, engaging with publics, creating a readiness that we're not doing as proactively as we need to do it because every individual will matter. That is the target group for the available vaccines at any rate. 
Um, this is just another uh, global study by the um, World Economic Forum. We are constantly scanning uh, surveys that other people are doing, but you can see in some parts of the world, particularly um, South Africa, um, Hungary, Poland, Russia are some of the most skeptical, but it's a different mix of countries than ours. So, but oftentimes there's a sense well europe you know they're skeptical and and the us is very skeptical actually africa is highly variable we look at uh, confidence in the importance and the safety it's overall high in importance but these are not high numbers for confidence and safety mali 59% mauritius only 45% feel they're safe togo had a 33% sense of safety these these are also some some of the poorest as well as some of the wealthiest countries. This is not a, a, an isolated issue. It is different in different countries. It's highly variable. It depends on politics. It depends on relationship with government. We um, uh, some other colleagues had looked at the ratio, relationship between trust in government and willingness to take a COVID vaccine. It varies. Some countries' relationship with government matters a lot. It matters less than other countries. For instance, uh, um, in India, it was the same. Um, uh, the trust in government was the same for those who would take a vaccine and who wouldn't. But in other places like in China, less trust in government, less willingness to take a vaccine. So these things do affect differently in different countries. And that's why we need to understand the variation for planning our strategies for engaging and communicating uh, with countries. Trust in medical profession, that's generally um, a, a strong indicator. Um, uh, influencer on people. But we have to think the medical profession themselves, um, there is hesitancy among the medical profession and the healthcare professionals that we are expecting to be having the first wave of these vaccines. We need to um, understand the issues and concerns, build their confidence because they will also be faced with more questions um, than anyone in, in as these vaccines roll out. The other issue that we found really uh, was an, as a factor influencing people's acceptance of a COVID vaccine, the country of manufacture. 65% um, of the people in our, uh, this was about nine, almost, it was around 18,000 people responding to this survey uh, in a representative samples in, in 17 countries. 65% um, said the country of manufacture would impact their decision on whether to take a vaccine. So that's also something to take into consideration for our communication and engagement strategies. Um, what's other, the other concerning factor is that in a number of countries, both in our own monitoring, and this was from a Pew uh, Center study, the uh, willingness to take a COVID vaccine has dropped across most surveys since uh, May. There was higher willingness to take a vaccine um, at the beginning of the pandemic and less now. That's a mix of factors. I mean, what's striking to me in the US setting is that the drop is consistent across gender, race, ethnicity, age, and education, almost consistently. This is not this drop in confidence and willingness to take a vaccine is not just because of just one part of the population. And this is absolutely consistent with what we're seeing in other countries. In the UK, 7% said they would not take a COVID vaccine back in April, May. It's now 17% saying they would not take a a vaccine. Why is that? Well, there wasn't that much discussion about vaccines early on. It was very much focused on um, uh, getting people um, masking, quarantine, just the immediate reaction. Um, there has been a lot more attention to vaccines, a lot more um, focus, a lot of information, confusing information, some really good, some uh, misinformation, but also people have had the experience of the pandemic and see that 
there are certain parts of the population that are more at risk than others. Um, and there's a kind of fatigue going on also. So uh, we need to be conscious of the landscape where we're introducing these uh, vaccines. Again, this is just the, the data I just mentioned going from 7% saying would not take a vaccine back in March and now up to uh, 17%. Um, whoops, uh, sorry, this clicker is. Um, we know the background that we read a lot in the media um, about vaccine hes hesitancy. It is real. It should not overwhelm. the. Pro There's a lot of positive um, encouragement for vaccines. It's not enough, but we do need to be managing this. Um, we're also in, we see this phenomenon now too, that what was just kind of the vaccine hesitant questioning groups stayed pretty much in their circles, but now there's been a convergence um, of uh, the anti-questioning vaccine groups merging with the anti-lockdown, anti-masking. Um, there's this broader libertarian movement going on and overt protest. And vaccine has mixed into that space of resisting government control and anything coming from government, which is a concern and another issue that we need to think through the best ways to uh, engage locally to do what we can to build, uh, sustain confidence in vaccines. Um, there are um, kind of, this is um, the US, but in different countries, uh, this kind of, this goes, we could have seen this exact same picture in uh, Leicester in the UK and Northern, in Northern England in the 1800s. These anti-government control issues are, are very old and deep-seated and have been a particularly acute now because it's not just about the vaccine, it's about many parts of our lives where people are feeling uh, over-controlled and are kicking back. Um, Africa, we've heard fantastic um, things in John's presentation um, and really impressive work. At the same time, as I mentioned, oops, I missed a slide here. Um, well, there was one, uh, we have also had some demonstrations in Africa against the COVID vaccine, certainly in South Africa, uh, the, against the trials, and we've had uh, issues in different, there's, there's also been a kind of denialism in some settings that COVID doesn't exist. And if somebody doesn't believe a virus exists, why would they even think about the vaccine? Uh, that's another, Another challenge. Just uh, there's a lot more on this topic. I have a book that came out just on the opening of COVID. Uh, it was written before COVID, but uh, published recent this last couple months. But uh, I managed to get a prologue on about COVID because it's highly relevant to this current situation um, and how we might move forward. Uh, this is our website, uh, the Vaccine Confidence Project. We are just overhauling it to make all the data that we have ourselves and what we're finding from others. Uh, we're creating a dashboard to make that totally accessible so you can go into different countries and see what is the state of public sentiment in your country and where you might need um, extra support and, and intervention to build confidence in vaccines. Thanks very much. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Hatchett. I'm the CEO of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiatives. Um, let me advance the slides. Um, first step, just want to say uh, wherever you are, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I want to thank Joel and, and Dan and ASTMH for inviting me to participate in uh, today's symposium. I um, will talk about COVID vaccine development and access. I, I, I will say um, that I submitted my slides 
a little over a week ago and, and where COVID vaccine development is concerned, this is, has, has been an extraordinary week. And unfortunately, I don't have any slides to uh, discuss the um, findings that have been reported by Pfizer, uh, uh, um, the, the Gamalea announcement from a couple of days after that, or, or today's really remarkable announcement uh, from Moderna uh, about the efficacy of their vaccine. Uh, but it has certainly been a, a, a very good week um, for the COVID-19 vaccine development efforts. Uh, we have proof of concept that spike-directed proteins uh, can pr produce you know, highly effective uh, protective immunity. We have proof of concept for the mRNA vaccines. We have a, a report from Gamalea, a very small number of, of cases, uh, obviously, um, but preliminary, that at least the data is trending in a good direction for that vaccine. If uh, we we'll obviously look forward to seeing uh, full reports for all of these vaccines, um, but it is, is certainly an encouraging time. We've also, in the last 10 days, uh, had the report of the outbreak in minks, which um, has spread to at least six countries, uh, involved hundreds of individuals who were infected by the mink-related vaccines in uh, Denmark, um, leading to the culling of the entire mink population in Denmark. Who knew that 17 million minks lived in Denmark? But um, you know, raising and, and genetic mutations in that virus raising concerns for some potential for immune escape, uh, showing less uh, responsiveness to antibodies. So a, a, a very eventful week. Uh, good news on the vaccine development front. Heidi, uh, you know, I, I love listening to Heidi's presentations. She gives a very compelling uh, account of the rise of vaccine hesitancy. Um, and the slides that she just showed about the decline in interest in getting a COVID-19 vaccine, very, very sobering. I think it's important to remember that in 2009, during the last pandemic, um, we actually vaccinated more people against seasonal influenza uh, we vaccinated about 120 million people in 19, I mean 2009, than we actually did against the pandemic virus in the United States. We only ended up vaccinating about 80 million people against the pandemic virus because of de a decline in interest by the time the vaccine was available. So we hope to maintain interest. I'm going to uh, run through a couple of preliminary slides, uh, then talk about CEPI's evolving role over the course of the pandemic. It has evolved and changed, I think, in interesting ways. Um, talk about some of the progress and challenges that we're encountering and finish with just a few thoughts looking towards the future. Um, many of you, I, I think, will probably be aware of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness uh, Innovations. Um, we were uh, we are a, a comparatively new organization established in 2017 um, specifically to support the development of vaccines against emerging infectious diseases and to support the development of rapid response platforms and, importantly, uh, to ensure access to those vaccines for the populations that need them. Uh, and our focus on both supporting development and supporting access have, have really come to the fore uh, during our response to COVID-19. Um, I'll, I'll just mention very briefly that prior to COVID-19, um, the emergence of COVID-19, we actually were investing in the development of coronavirus vaccines. We had allocated about $140 million to the development of MERS vaccines. We had, I believe, five MERS vaccine candidates that we were supporting. We had also uh, allocated about $60 million to the development of rapid response platforms. And as COVID emerged, and as we realized that it was a, a coronavirus, a new coronavirus, we were able to quickly turn these investments and, and to steer them into COVID-19 vaccine development. And, and that has, I think, proved to be very beneficial. Um, probably don't need to uh, dwell on this slide. It is, it's just to show the the current state of the epidemic. The numbers are truly extraordinary. Uh, yesterday, more than 600,000 cases 
of uh, coronavirus documented worldwide. That's documented cases. And surely there is a, a tremendous amount of under ascertainment, about 8,000 deaths reported yesterday. The numbers uh, are, are, are truly astounding and the impact of the disease uh, continues to mount worldwide. Over the next few slides, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, CEPI's evolving role over the course of the pandemic. Uh, just a, a very quick preview. I would say in the early stages of the, of the pandemic, we played a very important role as a non-governmental organization that could quickly move um, resources into vaccine development in, in providing what I would call ignition funding. Over the last several months, our attention has shifted to focusing on ensuring global access to those vaccines. And now we are beginning to look towards the future and, and towards needs that the market may not be fully incorporating yet and to think about how public sector financing can ensure that we have the vaccines that we need for the long term. And I'll, 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 I'll kind of walk through all of that in the next few slides. Um, we uh, realized that the uh, pandemic was going to be a significant event very early uh, on. We actually elevated our alert posture as an organization just days after the December 31st announcement by China of the outbreak in Wuhan. Um, and as things unfolded and, and the announcements were made that uh, this was a new coronavirus, I think that was around January 9th or January 10th with the subsequent publication of the uh, genetic sequences, we, we uh, realized that we needed to initiate vaccine development. Now at that time, uh, we interpreted that to mean to just develop candidate vaccines. We didn't necessarily fully intend at that point in time to take them into clinical testing or into full development, but we wanted to have candidate vaccines in the freezer as it were, so that we could watch how things evolved. And it was not clear if containment would be possible then, but between January 15th and January 20th, the number of cases began to escalate rapidly, uh, increasing from around 41, I think, to over 300. Uh, and it became very clear that there was efficient human-to-human -human transmission taking place. And on January 23rd, we actually announced our, our, our first partnerships to develop vaccines. And by that point, we had decided that we needed, not only did we need candidate vaccines, but we needed likely to carry them into phase one clinical trials. And so we provided uh, very rapid funding to partners, including uh, on January 23rd, we announced partnerships with Inovio, Moderna, and the University of, of Queensland. Uh, the partnership with Moderna um, was uh, established within 48 hours of first contact between Moderna and CEPI. And we provided a, a small but, but critical early contribution to that effort in providing funding for the manufacturing of the clinical trial material for the phase one clinical trials, which commenced uh, about two months later. Uh, subsequently, we established a portfolio of nine um, vaccines that we provided funding to. Um, those candidates were uh, very deliberately, they were, they were selected. We did, we did conduct a, a, a very fast call for proposals in early February, um, and we, we selected a deliberately diversified portfolio, diversified both in terms of the vaccine technology, but also diversified in terms of the geography of the candidates. And of the eight, I mean, of the nine vaccines that we invested in in January, February, and March, Eight are now in clinical trials. Three, soon to be four, or possibly even five, will be in phase three clinical trials, which is a substantial proportion of the total uh, global total right now of, of 10 vaccines that have reached phase three. And I think that speaks to the importance of early public sector financing to initiate vaccine development very quickly if we have new emerging threats. Um, I want to shift gears now to, to, to talk about uh, our access commitments and the role that CEPI has played with a number of other global organizations in establishing the uh, Access to COVID-19 Tools or ACT Accelerator, um, which was established to support the, the rapid development and then the, the procurement and distribution of both vaccines, and I'll talk about the, the COVAX initiative, which is part of the ACT Accelerator, uh, as well as diagnostics, therapeutics, 
and other critical medical material, including oxygen and dexamethasone um, and, and other products that will be required to save lives globally. Um, the ACT accelerator was uh, conceptualized literally from sort of first conception in the very last days of March um, to um, its global establishment on April 24th, uh, 2020 in an event, a co-hosted live event that Dr. Tedros from WHO um, and other global leaders, uh, uh, Macron, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, Melinda Gates um, participated in um, to stand up this effort and to promote global collaboration around the development uh, and distribution of needed medical countermeasures. Now the idea with the ACT Accelerator is through the application of these medical countermeasures and, and very selected investments in health systems strengthening to reduce the uh, incidence of severe illness, either by providing vaccines to prevent disease altogether or therapeutics to reduce its impact diagnostics to allow for early identification of disease, but to reduce the incidence of severe illness leading to a reduction in impact and stress on healthcare systems leading to a ability to control the disease, which would reduce the economic disruption um, that the disease is causing, all in the interest ultimately with the goal of ending the acute phase of the pandemic by the end of 2021, so that the world can gradually begin to restore normalcy uh, and obviously reduce the long-term impact of the pandemic. Um, we'll just mention the ACT Accelerator's uh, structure so that people understand it. Uh, it, is a, it is a very interesting, I'll, I'll call it a, 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 a multi-pectoral, um, multilateral effort. Now, WHO is a, a critically important player in the ACT Accelerator, but it's not controlling um, the activities of all the partners. The ACT Accelerator brings together multilateral organizations like WHO and UNICEF um, and the World Bank into, into partnership with non-governmental organizations, and you can see them here represented on the graph under a number of pillars focusing on vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, um, and health system strengthening in partnership with countries and with the private sector, with industry partners, uh, all collaborating together in their appropriate spheres to advance the, um, the development, procurement, delivery of, of these products. Now, under the ACT Accelerator, CEPI has partnered with WHO and with Gavi um, in the, to coordinate the vaccines pillar, um, which we also refer to as COVAX. And many of you will have heard about the, the COVAX facility, uh, which is the procurement mechanism, um, which has brought together remarkably for something that was established only um, in the last several months. It has brought together 186 uh, countries and economies um, into partnership um, to support the, the procurement and, and careful distribution of vaccine. And this is all predicated on our assessment that um, vaccine will continue to be a scarce resource, even with the terrific news of the last week, vaccine will continue to be a scarce resource throughout 2021, and therefore it will need to be targeted to priority populations. And if our goal is to use the vaccine for the end for which it was created, which is to end the pandemic uh, globally, not just in a single country, um, that vaccine will need to be distributed in a rational fashion so that we can treat Health, I mean, so that we can vaccinate healthcare workers and the most vulnerable populations, the elderly, those with comorbid medical conditions that Dr. Fauci described globally. And that if we can do that globally and vaccinate what we estimate to be in the range of 20% of the population in most countries, we can very substantially reduce the impact of the pandemic and thereby end what we're calling the acute phase of the pandemic while we continue to ramp up vaccine production towards achieving herd immunity sometime in 2022 or, or beyond. The reason that we need uh, COVAX relates to what would happen if we don't have 
COVAX, which is what happened in 2009, which was during the first pandemic of the 21st century, when a handful of countries, approximately 10, perhaps 12 or 15 countries, uh, essentially cornered the, the global supply of vaccine to meet the needs of their populations. Each of the countries, without casting aspersions, each, each of the countries was acting rationally in their own self-interest, but without any coordinated effort to see that the, the vaccine supplies were distributed globally, um, not just for ethical reasons, but also for efficiency reasons in terms of bringing the pandemic under control. And in 2009, ultimately, nine of the countries that, that helped to corner that market did donate vaccine um, for other countries that had no access to vaccine, but the donated vaccine did not reach those countries until well after the, the major waves of the pandemic uh, had subsided. Finally, uh, I want to, uh, looking towards the future, um, CEPI is, is now scanning you know, the, the uh, portfolio, the global portfolio of vaccines to look at the, at, there are over 300 vaccine candidates under development. CEPI is assessing that portfolio, looking at the vaccines that are in wave one, looking at their attributes, uh, potential challenges to their delivery, um, and thinking about what kind of vaccines will we need for the future. I think we all understand and accept that COVID-19 is going to become a globally endemic disease. We are going to be dealing with it for years, if not the indefinite future. And right now we don't know uh, how enduring the immunity provided by the vaccines that we will have from the first wave of candidates, how enduring that immunity will be. And, and therefore we don't know if we're going to have to you know, provide continual boosters annually or semi-annually or every five years. We'd like to have vaccines that are very inexpensive to produce, that um, have good uh, thermostability uh, and that can be used in the most austere of environments and can be used to protect all segments of all populations without respect to geography. And, and our assessment is we probably still need to augment um, the pool of vaccines that we are likely to have if we want to achieve you know, that kind of global ability to provide global coverage. Talk briefly about um, some of the great progress we've seen as well as some of the outstanding challenges. Um, one of the, the most remarkable things to observe uh, over the last 10 months, and we have to remember, you know, we have only been developing vaccines for 10 months. It was 300 days from release of the sequences to the phase three clinical trial results for Pfizer. Um, are the number of clinical trials that have been mounted and their global distribution. It, it, it's not perfect. There are you know, a limited number of trials in African populations, and we've been working closely with John and would like to, like to advance uh, vaccine clinical trials in Africa. But remarkable number of, of clinical trials um, in 32 countries to date across a wide array of vaccine candidates. Um, we've also seen, and, and CEPI has supported uh, where, we, where we can, the scaling up and scaling out of manufacturing. So we, we have seen the tremendous investments in the United States in developing vaccine manufacturing capacity for the vaccines supported by Operation Warp Speed. But we've made investments too. The European Union has made investments. China has made investments. And many of the leading vaccine candidates have engaged in tech transfer activities with partners in Brazil, in um, Bangladesh, in India, and elsewhere to uh, advance the production of, of vaccine candidates globally. And, and I, this has come together in an ad hoc way. I think as we emerge from the COVID period, we need to think about how to systematize that sharing of vaccine technology, making sure that the, the platforms that will emerge from the COVID-19 response that they are embedded in manufacturing facilities worldwide so that we can mount a rapid response and rapidly scale production in the future. Um, Kate O'Brien from WHO has referred to uh, some of what she calls the human-made uh, potential rate limiters to distributing vaccine. And these, these are um, legal structures that we have put in place or um, regulatory structures, not that the regulatory structures are a barrier, but the complexity 
of meeting regulatory requirements in more than 190 different countries. We have to find ways during a pandemic to be able to rationalize um, you know, how regulation of urgently needed, rapidly developed vaccines occurs. And uh, WHO has been leading global efforts to do that. Even just providing uniform labeling uh, has presented challenges. And certainly uh, there, there are challenges around indemnification of vaccine manufacturers who, are, who um, understandably want to provide, make sure that risk is shared among all participants and, and stakeholders and that they are not left just holding the bag for liability for these vaccines that they have um, you know, made heroic efforts to develop, but which have been developed um, quickly and, and where even with large clinical trials of 30, 40, 50,000 people, you're talking about scaling from a clinical trial of that size to potentially vaccinating tens or hundreds of millions of, of people. So you, you, you are not working through a normal process where you are accumulating experience with the vaccine at the normal rates that we do. So it, it's, a, it's a very challenging uh, issue, but, but we are working hard to address these issues. Everyone wants to address these issues, but the, the global scale and the complexity of the problems that we're encountering uh, certainly makes this a tremendous, tremendous challenge. Um, finally, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention um, both for CEPI as a supporter of R&D and for the ACT Accelerator as a whole, there is still a, a very significant outstanding uh, requirement for additional funding. And as the focus turns to procurement and to delivery, I think it is, uh, it is easy to realize that some of the outstanding and ongoing R&D requirements have not yet been met, either in vaccines or for diagnostics or for therapeutics. And um, I, I think we're trying to you know, keep the world's attention where it needs to be, which is managing the pandemic and, and, and moving the products that become available out as quickly as we can without forgetting that um, there will be generations of products and that we can, we can secure iterative improvements in those products over time. Um, finally, uh, just very briefly, Looking to the future, um, 2021, the mission is, is pretty clear. For, this is the COVAX um, mission is to deliver, to procure and deliver 2 billion doses of, of vaccine to the world in the interest of ensuring that every country has the ability to protect its healthcare workers and protect its most vulnerable populations. Um, our goal is, is to ideally to reach an allocation of about 20% of the population in participating countries will need to have more than 2 billion doses at, at this rate, given the number of countries that have chosen to participate in COVAX to achieve that goal. Um, but we'll also have to work with countries to you know, make sure that they are prepared to receive, deliver, uh, uh, distribute, and dispense vaccine to their populations. Uh, and, and, and so we have a, a major challenge ahead of us just to focus on the 2021 goals but then beyond uh, 2021, I think we need to begin to think even now uh, about what the agenda uh, for the world with respect to epidemic and pandemic preparedness will be in a post-COVID world. I, I think what we will see undoubtedly is heightened political will to address the problem. A, 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 this problem now has a saliency for elected officials that it has never had before, we will also see a revolution in vaccinology in the form of many new platforms that will have been validated by developing COVID-19 vaccines. And that will fundamentally change the R&D agenda as it relates to epidemic preparedness and response. And finally, I, I, I think we will see global support for making the kind of you know, Apollo program scale investments at a global scale that will be required to systematically and, and comprehensively reduce the risk of future pandemics of this scale. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Hi, um, am I on now? I, I can't see myself. Oh. 
Wow. Well, those were fantastic presentations. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, I'm going to ask some questions. We've gotten tons from the audience. I had a few myself I was hoping to slip in, and we only have 15 minutes. So I'm going to ask the speakers to uh, answer sort of or view this as sort of like a rapid fire round of questions, if you don't mind. Um, sorry for that. Uh, John, there's a lot of interest in amongst uh, our audience of, uh, about what um, you attribute the, the rising trend of cases in um, Africa to. What's going on there? Why is uh, control sort of appearing to be slipping? So I think there, there, there's, um, there are several reasons, and they are also related that we are seeing this. Uh, if, you, I, if you recall the slide I showed, um, countries took some very aggressive measures early on, both in terms of closing schools, the airspace, the, the, the borders, and, and even restriction of movement of people. And uh, as of June timeline, July, uh, and they started easing that, the, that, that, that movement, and movement has started occurring across the continent. And as you expect, as people uh, move across the continent, you see uh, the, the increase in number of cases. I think that is one. The second, I believe, is that uh, we are beginning to really see uh, what I call prevention uh, uh, fatigue. Right. I'm doing, currently doing a tour of, of the countries. I just came back from Cameroon to continue to beat the drum of Don Relent, Don Relent. And you see that the level of masking that used to be very common, including here in Ethiopia, is uh, it's really going down. It, it used to be that you drive across the city. I used to do that, run a, drive across the city of Addis Ababa. You see that everybody is 100% masked. And in some countries, I just have just uh, the population that literally just abandoned uh, the massing. I think that is dangerous. And that my message to the continent is that uh, be careful. This is going to be dangerous if um, the gains that we had achieved previously will be wiped away if we uh, get into the prevention fatigue mode. I think those, to me, are the two key factors that are making the virus to uh, begin to creep back up steadily. Thank you very much. Heidi, I was wondering, um, you know, your presentation was sobering, um, but I'm wondering if if you have any data that would help us sort of understand what the apparent efficacy of the first vaccines, um, what an impact that might have on acceptance. Uh, you know, I know there's been a ton of talk previously that these vaccines might not be any better than flu vaccines, but they're coming in, you know, with early VE uh, estimates that are much higher. Will that help to get people to agree to be vaccinated? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, it's really been a very hopeful um, uh, week in that sense. Uh, in general, safety is uh, an important lever of acceptance, but efficacy also is. I mean, one of the reasons that sometimes we have a, a challenge with getting people to take a flu vaccine is they feel like, well, it doesn't really work that well. And I think if we can say, actually, this works very well, um, it's already uh, a boost for confidence. Um, it's not going to be the only thing we need, but it, it absolutely is going to help. Great. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, if COVAX, if CEPI, if, the, you know, the partners in COVAX have heard from the incoming U.S. administration, is there any indication that when um, the president-elect becomes president, that the United States will join that um, effort? Well, I, let me let me start by saying I, I think there are limitations on what the transition team can do right now uh, because of the ongoing situation in the states. Um, but but let me say that Vice President Biden, then now President Elect Biden, um, you know, was was part of an administration that led the global effort to provide vaccine globally, uh, albeit, you know. Uh, it, probably too late and certainly too little given the global demand. But um, Vice President-elect Biden, you know, had that experience in the last pandemic of, of, of leading an effort to pull nations together to provide vaccine globally to meet global needs. So I would have every confidence uh, just based on that experience. And of course, uh, President-elect Biden has also indicated his support for WHO, his intention to 
uh, restoring U.S. participation in WHO and, I, and his support for multilateral mechanisms. So I, I would be very confident um, that there will be support for COVAX. Does that mean you haven't had a call? I don't think they're allowed to make <laughs> okay. it right now. I think you have to get State Department clearance, uh, but I, I don't know that for a fact. Okay. Um, one Another question here for John. Is there an increased risk of contracting uh, COVID-19, excuse me, among HIV uh, positive people who are on antiretroviral viral therapy? Are there data on that? I don't think we have seen data on that uh, at all. We, uh, I mean, when this pandemic started with, uh, as a continent that is plagued with uh, HIV, uh, TB and malaria, we were never sure how this would pan out. And again, uh, uh, we have not seen uh, data to, to, to suggest that. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, Heidi, I'm wondering about um, campaigns to sort of ready the public for the vaccine program. You know, I'm based in the U.S. We're not seeing them here. I'm rather surprised that that there isn't messaging to try to get people to understand what's going to be coming, what these vaccines might and might not do, and, uh, you know, that they're going to be administered in a tiered fashion as they become available. Are countries, other countries doing that now? And who's doing it well if they are? Well, I don't think anyone's really there yet because there's been a hesitation to see, you know, not to create over expectation. Um, and but and I we're not going to I think the other concern is that um, uh, we're not going to have enough for everybody up front, no matter which, even if we get all three, you know, multiple vaccines. Um, it's going to be for different age group. There's logistics to sort out. So that's not to say we couldn't do a better job of creating more public awareness about what these different candidates are, you know, how they're made, you know, what to be looking at. We can, we can absolutely do better than that. I think there, uh, a campaign approach more broadly that you might do, for instance, with a measles vaccine wouldn't really be appropriate with the COVID vaccine. I think that we're going to need very targeted engagement um, with, for instance, healthcare professionals, as I've, I've said, you know, if we're expecting them, these to be used in, in care homes and, and with people working there, we're going to need a different kind of engagement. Um, and certainly in, in lower income countries, that again is going to be different. So it's going to, it's going to be a more than usual uh, need to be a more than usual varied approach and, and engaged with the specific groups as the vaccine rolls out. But again, that's not to say um, that, as you point out, we should be having better, and particularly now, as there's more and more, because we see that the in misinformation comes up as soon as the information kicks in, because it's always like, you know, there's information, there's counter information. So here we have a week that's just one announcement after another almost, and it's enough to each one is sparking a lot of talk online. We hear it, we see it. Um, it's like we have a, a thunderstorms on, on, the, on the platforms right now. So now we really need to get in there and provide that basic kind of, well, what does this all mean? And how do these vaccines compare? So that, that does need more proactive. And, and frankly, I have not seen that yet anywhere. I have had a lot of people calling to say, you know, help us because we know we need this. Um, but I think uh, we've, we've got some work to do, but quite urgently, I'd say. Great. Um, Richard, uh, you know, you meant reference to the um, H1N1 experience and how uh, a number of countries, a small number of countries effectively cornered the market. Um, I know you're, you and uh, Gavi and, and WHO have been doing a ton of work on this, um, but there are, I think many, many of the same players have been uh, making advanced purchases and, you know, the spreadsheet I was keeping for a while would suggest that there are billions of doses that are already spoken for. 
how confident are you that there's going to be enough vaccine that um, countries that that are part of COVAX that haven't been able to um, buy doses in it, you know, individually, that, that there's going to be the product there? Well, so I'm ac I'm actually confident. I think I think there is going to be an even distribution because because we have seen a large number of bilateral. Uh, commitments that have been made. Uh, a number of countries have at least potentially over procured vaccine if 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 the vaccines continue to show success, uh, they'll be in a position of oversupply and potentially some of that vaccine could then be presumably shared through global mechanisms. So but leaving that aside, with respect to COVAX itself, one of the I, I think uh, important aspects of the structure that maybe is not widely understood is that where we have provided, where COVAX through CEPI has provided significant R&D funding, which is not every single vaccine in our portfolio, but where we have provided significant R&D funding at an early stage and taken a great deal of risk, we have also secured for the facility actually um, uh, access commitments, supply commitments that make the facility customer number one in line for, you know, actually well over a billion doses. Um, and that is secure supply for the facility. There is going to be, the facility is, is set up not exclusively to rely on just the R&D portfolio within the facility, but it can also go out onto global markets and purchase additional vaccine. And it will be a mix of that vaccine emerging from the R&D investments plus globally available doses that will provide the vaccine uh, through COVAX. So I am very confident that the, the facility will have a, a large quantity of doses, uh, but there will, as you say, be uneven distribution. Thank you, and I hope you're right. Um, John, I think we're gonna send the last question to you. This is from somebody in the audience, and Richard, you might wanna jump in on this one too. Somebody asks, what is the cost effect effectiveness to use a vaccine in an African country where the COVID positivity is very low? If this situation is this a situation, I'm not quite clear on this, but is this situation going to influence the, the willingness of the population to accept use of vaccine in a circumstance like that? Heidi, you may also have a thought. Anyone want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. I think that, um, let, let me start with, with this. I think we, mm -hmm. we truly, uh, as a continent, we are not out of the wood yet at all. I think our numbers should not um, uh, deceive anyone to believe in that uh, uh, COVID is not an issue uh, on, on the continent. And I think that is one. The second thing is that uh, the same things that are protecting, that are perceived to have protected the continent, like the youthfulness of the population, and which is leading to a very high number of people being asymptomatic dead at uh, that age group, we can tend to be a negative for us in the long run because that group becomes a reservoir because they are they are running around with infections and they don't know that they are infected and they are transmitting and then nothing. Mm -hmm. We all now know that I mean there's a lot of plenty of transmission occurring at that, that um, with this, uh, as people amongst people who are asymptomatic. So our greatest fear is that that group becomes a really a, 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 a fuel that continuous transmission of, of the virus. There. So I think we really uh, they don't know that um, at least no, the, what we are seeing about close to 2 million people on the continent infected will stay that way. And again, our data is showing that we are not uh, are complete, we are not out of the wood at all. And you really don't know also how high the second peak will come. I mean, we've seen in Europe where in April or so, the, the, the first peak was at where we, it was, and then we now know where it is there. So I think it's very early to begin to draw any conclusion in that direction. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave it there. I wish I could ask you three questions for a lot longer. And I know our audience wishes they could have got, I could have gotten to more of their questions too. But it was a really uh, informative session. Thank you very much for uh, your presentations and your thoughts. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.